The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Summer music festivals are back. So to celebrate all this July, the Agenda in the Summer revisits conversations with a diverse cast of musicians and music experts. Tonight, Steve Pakin's 2020 conversation with Jan Arden. For many people, being inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame would be a crowning achievement on a career well done. But not for Jan Arden. Instead, she is busier than ever. The eight-time Juno award-winning singer-songwriter is also star of her own comedy series, hosts a lifestyle podcast, and has written an honest and fierce new memoir. It's called If I Knew Then, Finding Wisdom in Failure and Power in Aging. And we're delighted that it brings Jan Arden back to our airwaves tonight from Spring Bank, Alberta, just west of Calgary. It's so good to see you again. Very good to be here, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. Although the last time you were on this program, uh, actually, it's funny. We talked about many of the same things we're going to talk about tonight. We talked about self-acceptance. We talked about aging. And so I know you've been thinking about this for a while. Uh, but you were in the studio, and I miss the fact that you're not here. But... Um, but I'd like to walk down memory lane with you just a little bit, shall we? Here's a clip from the last time you were here. So there is a sense of joy, and I feel like I'm getting older, so I'm not as hard on myself as I used to be, and age is the only thing that does that for you. You just, you get older and you abandon the, uh, the flightiness of youth, and you just start really enjoying life, and I think that's where I'm at right now, You too. want to fess up to how old you are? I know 43. It... I just turned 43 Easter Sunday. Congratulations. Yeah, I'm, I'm damn proud out of it. Every line, scar, <laughs> blemish, bruise, <laughs> varicose vein. I love it. Bought and paid for, as my friend Leonard Parker would say. Those are life's experiences, man. I, who, why would you want to lie about your age? I never really understood that. You've earned it. Thank God you're here. We're going to play this tape back in 10 or 15 years, and you may change your mind by then. I'm going to say, God, I didn't, I look great. That's what I'll be saying. <laughs> well, here we are 15 years later, and um, boy, you still look fantastic, I got to say. Don't you think? I, well, I remember really liking that version of me, and, and uh, it's, it's great to see I had, um, that was probably like not even quite halfway through my career yet, but I recognized my colleague, Russell Broom, and um, Maury Lafoy was playing bass. Uh, yeah, no, it, it is. It's great getting older, and I stand by every single word. It's um, it's a privilege for one thing. Uh, even at my age, at 58, I've lost several friends over the years to various things, and it's, it's always heartbreaking. But I am not one of those people who you will ever hear say, "I wish I was younger. I wish I could go back." Um, I have no desire to be young again. I'm looking forward to be older being older and I hope I have that opportunity. It doesn't bother me at all. My my mother was my greatest champion and my greatest teacher when it came to things like that. So I'm going to follow along right behind her. She, she, was, she was really such a marvel to me. Well, you do say in the book, you never really figured out life until you turned 50 and you were only 43 there. So what what happened at 50 that somehow a light came on that wasn't on when you were 43 during that interview? Well, I don't think it was any one particular thing that happened at 50. I think it's the accumulation of knowledge, of wisdom, of time, of ex experiences. You know, you the human brain learns how to adapt and how to respond. The way you, you navigate a situation at 55 is much different than you navigate at 25. That's just time. Um, but yeah, I, I keep telling younger people that I meet now, I'm like, listen, you're not even going to become a person until you turn 45. And they just look at me like, what? But it's, it is. It's, it, it seems so simple when you say it, but it is absolutely the, the accumulation of time and experiences that lets you go forward in a much more intrepid way, in a much more confident way that you're not constantly having this conversation in your head that penalizes everything you do and every idea that you have. No, you can't do that. That'll never work. You've got to do this. Um, you know, why do you think that you could possibly, you know, accomplish that? That's the voice that will, I think the first 
30 years of our lives, 35 years of our lives. Now I actually have someone in my head cheering me on all the time, going, why not? Just do it. <laughs> oh, who cares if you fall off? So Although, that, can, can, I take, difference. can I take issue with something you say right at the very beginning of the book, which is you call yourself a crone. You say, now that I'm a crone. And, you know, when I think of a crone, Jan, I think of kind of a 90-year-old frail woman in a wheelchair or in a rocking chair, and that's not you. Oh, I'm a crone. I'm definitely a crone. I am the woman crawling out of the trees with a big stick. <laughs> um, you know, and if you're not beside me, get out of my way. Maybe it's the June version of the crone, but a crone is a, is a lovely being. She's someone that doesn't need a lot of company in order to be happy. I think one thing that has really come to forefront in my mind during all this COVID stuff is that I actually like myself a lot. And, you know, we've all been forced to spend time by ourselves and, and, and alone with our thoughts. And I write about that in this book as well, how important it is, even if you have three kids or two jobs, or, you know, you're driving kids around to hockey, whatever it is that you're doing that doesn't allow you to have time by yourself, maybe COVID has presented each and every one of us with that opportunity of having an hour where you can hear yourself think. And, uh, but like I was saying, I, I actually like myself and that is the goal of a human life. We, I don't know why we, we are led to believe that we need to be in a state of constant opposition to who we are, and how we think and what we do. I, I like who I am. And that is big in human life. It lets you go forward in a way that you, you, you can't if you don't like yourself. Well, I think that answer reflects uh, a couple of things. Number one, I appreciate your making in the book the distinction between being alone and being lonely. They are different things. And certainly, uh, you know, you've expressed the importance of, of having time to oneself. But the thing that also comes out, and you've had, I mean, let's, uh, you've been very open and blunt about it. You've had a hell of a life with a lot of challenges and a lot of difficulties, and, and, and we'll talk about some of them here. But your optimism that just insists on powering through and, and let's just start by going back. You spent a lot of time alone as a kid of, oh, I don't know what you were, I mean, early teenage years, maybe even before, in the basement of your home alone, and you didn't mind it because you were hiding from your dad's alcoholism. And as it turns out, that's what introduced you to a guitar and songwriting, and you'd written 300 songs by the time you were, you know, whatever, a teenager. How do you find that optimistic path when it would be so easy to go the other way? Well, I, I believe good things come out of bad things. Uh, absolutely. You know, good things come out of bad things. My dad's alcoholism sent my life in a direction that would have been um, unreasonable to me at 10 or 11 or 12 years old. And let me just... Uh, <laughs> add a caveat to what you said about 300 songs. They were perhaps the worst 300 songs that the world had ever heard and will never hear. You know, I was certainly on a trajectory to learning how to compose songs and put them together. And I had terrible lyrics, terrible melodies. They were terrible. Once in a while, maybe I had like three that were like, Ooh, this, these kind of make sense. But anyway, um, it was not the work of a genius by any stretch of the imagination. But I, um, yeah, I was trying to stay away from my dad, who was very unpredictable. We had our record player down there. We had uh, all these Columbia House records. We were members of the Columbia House Record Club. I highly recommend it. But, you know, we were in a rural area. And I remember we got two TV stations. We've got, I'm really dating myself now, two TV stations. We had like a couple of radio stations. Um, but I... Uh, yeah, it, it was, it, something happened to me that would never have happened had it not been for dad's alcoholism. I, hmm. There's no other way for me to explain it. Well, I'll take you a little bit further forward because, and I'd love it if you'd tell this story. If Alan and Jill had not broken up, <laughs> you might not be the superstar you are today. Explain. Good things come out of bad things. I had been working with a fellow in, in Calgary named Neil McGonigal for several years, probably five years, living in a basement suite, composing songs, making demos, sending them out, constant, 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 constant. 
Um, you know, at the end of five years, it was, you know, we were running out of money, running out of ideas, running out of, running out of labels. Last cassette went out to a young fella named Alan Reed. He was, he was 26 years old, looking to sign the next Nirvana. It was the early nineties. <clears throat> anyway, he put my cassette in his car and listened to it a little bit, you know, girl singing love songs with an acoustic guitar. Wasn't really his bag. And he passed. And a couple of days later, his girlfriend, fiance, Jill Schnell, I still see her <laughs> around, broke up with him. And he was devastated and took a bit of time off, composed himself, went back to work. <clears throat> Excuse me. And guess whose cassette was still in his car? So here's a young man, 26, going through his first heartbreak, puts gets in his car, turns it on, and the first song that came on was a, a song called I Just Don't Love You Anymore, which did end up being on my first record. And he pulled his car over because there was no cell phones in those days. <laughs> and he signed me to a record deal. He said, I don't know if we're ever gonna sell a record, but let's do it. He says, I think I understand what it is that you do. I wonder if, like I've always wanted to ask you this question. Get, Given that that's how you were discovered and how it all eventually happened, do you ever wonder whether if those two hadn't broken up, that story that you just told never would have happened? Maybe you would not have been discovered. Maybe you would not have had the career you've had. Or, or, or you know, was your talent so obviously there and your drive so obviously there that it, would, it, it wouldn't happen that way, but it would have happened another way? What do you think? I don't know, Steve. Hmm. I don't know if I believe that. I don't, I don't know if I believe that the outcome would have been me pursuing music. Um, I don't know if I would have be the person sitting here talking to you. I just don't know how to answer that. I think what is known compared to what is unknown in this life, in this space that we occupy in the abyss is so beyond anything I could ever imagine. All I know is I believe in goodness I believe in intention. I believe that thoughts are things and that you can really change and shape your life by how you perceive yourself in the world and how you think of yourself. And it is a constant battle. I talk about it in the book. You know, I talk about, you know, let's face it, the longest conversation you're going to have with anyone in your life is you. Hmm. And we have some pretty derogatory, pretty horrible conversations with ourselves, And I think when that young lady you spoke to at 43 years old in that clip that you showed, I think she was just starting to actually believe her own crap <laughs> and to believe that things were possible for me and that I was deserving of succeeding. You know, it's, it's glaringly um, obvious that most people deal much better with failure than they do success. When people fail, they expect it. I mean, I think there's been lots of studies done on that too. You know, when they don't get a job or they don't win the lottery or they don't win a race or they don't, when they fail, they're like, of course, I've already told myself this a billion times. I'm not, I, I knew that, I knew I wasn't gonna get it. So I don't know why we don't feel like we can't turn that conversation around. My mom used to say to me as a young person, as a teenager, one thing she said to me, she goes, Jan, I hope you aspire to something more than just getting married. That really stuck with me because a lot of little girls are said, that's the end all be all, that's what you should be. That should be the goal. That should be what you're firing the gun at is marriage. And my mom was no. And I think it's because she looked at her own life and went, I hope you want more than this. And it was heartbreaking. and and pivotal for me at the same time. But she also said to me in my 20s when I was starting to do music, why not you? Why not you? And because I had someone, because I had a mom that championed me and accepted me and cheered me on despite massive, a, a massive thing in the world telling me that I couldn't do it, that I shouldn't be able to, I was because I had her voice ringing in my head 
when I didn't have my own. So that was that was a big part of my story and continues to be. My mom um, informs my life and my decisions every single day, and she's been gone a couple of years now. I think that's her picture over your left shoulder, is it not? She, that's me in the back of a book, but I think my mom is here. Here's my mom. There we go. Well, yeah. there were, those two quotes you gave of your mother's are great, but there was a third one that I wrote down because I thought it was very compelling as well, and that one was, if you can't be brave, be reckless. Now, are those, those are not the words I would have thought that would come out of the mouth of a mom in rural Alberta in the 1960s oh. or 70s. Did you, what did you infer from those? Well, I, I think my mom had stolen that from my aunt Ern, my great aunt Ern. So it was my mother's aunt and she was about four foot nothing. And my aunt Ern was a person that would jump off a bridge or drive a car through a fire. And I think she had a lot of influence on my mom. And, and to me, that always just meant, just do it. Just worry about the, it's easier to beg forgiveness than ask for permission. I think that's kind of what I gleaned from that. And sometimes, you know, recklessness is, is the absence of bravery. But I, I, I feel like they work in tandem. I really do, Steve. It, it sometimes, a reckless conjures up you know, someone not caring and not being aware of the lives they're affecting around them. But I, I think you can be insulated and still be reckless and, and not, you know, hurt other people. So, but that was my mom. I didn't always understand everything she said to me, that's for sure. Hmm. I want to put one of your dad's quotes to you as well, because uh, he had something that I jotted down here as well. He said, <laughs> He said, the worst marriages don't end in divorce. They don't <laughs> end. They don't end. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is a pretty, um, well, it's a pretty out there thing for somebody who was married for 60 years to be saying, right? So what did you infer from that? I think the fact that people feel martyred, I think sometimes in marriages, maybe my parents were cut from a cloth where you stay together no matter what. And my mom said, well, we, we just felt like we had more together than we did apart. And neither of us wanted to start over again. But she did kick him out at one point. You know, I think 15, 20 years into their marriage, she booted him out of the house. And uh, because because of his drinking, obviously. But he, my, my dad, as much as he joked a lot of the time, there was a lot of truth in his very bizarre sense of humor. You know, he used to always tell me, first the man, he takes the drink, then the drink, he takes the man. And that always stuck with me, too, um, in a haunting kind of a way. It stole so much of his life. Even when he quit drinking, he resented it so much that he was kind of a miserable guy. My friend Stephanie called him the goddamn it guy. Hmm. But your mother would only call him the GD guy because she never swore, right? She didn't swore and she didn't swear until she got Alzheimer's and then she said things that I never ever thought I'd hear coming out of her mouth <laughs> but my god did we laugh <laughs> well let me get back on the on the uh, dr drugs and alcohol issue because uh, and I can't remember who said this it might have been your dad you might have heard it from someone else people who abuse drugs and alcohol are practicing how to die that must have hit you hard eh it did mm -hmm. and I, I never wanted to be like my dad I, I figured if I didn't drink rum that I would never have be like him. That's what he drank all the time, and he always smelled of rum. Um, if rum was the last thing in a mini bar, I wouldn't drink it, even if I was desperate. If that tells you anything, mm. I think any kid that witnesses an alcoholic parent and the unilateral damage that that drinking does in a family, I just feel for them so much. I regret so many of the things that I did in my life. I, I just always thought that I had control of alcohol and that it wasn't a problem. And it was because I didn't drink like my dad that I thought I was okay. I was kind of a binger. I, I wasn't one of those people that woke up and started drinking in the morning. So I thought I can't be an alcoholic if I'm not like that. Because my dad drank every day, all day. I just, when I did drink, which was you know, maybe a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night, I sort of wasted myself, but then I would, wouldn't drink for four days. And I thought, see, 
I'm not, I don't have a problem. I'm fine. And that's just not how alcohol works. I always say to people that ask me about stopping drinking, and I get asked all the time, how did you stop? That's always a telling question to me if they're coming to me and asking me that. My answer to them is always, if you have looked in a mirror at any time in your life, recently, not so recently, and if you've said to yourself, you know, in that moment, you know, with you, your toothbrush and the mirror, and you've said, you're drinking too much. You're drinking too much, Jan. I said that to myself so many times over the years. Don't give up trying. Like, don't give up trying to stop because that's, that voice gets quieter and quieter and quieter as you progress in a disease like alcoholism. Any kind of addiction, that voice gets quieter. But I, I got lucky. I just, um, I just had the sense to stop doing it. And I'm very grateful. Well, it was one of the things that surprised me about the book, because I know Frank Sinatra is saying regrets I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. And you, on the other hand, say that you have lived a life riddled with regrets, which I I was surprised of with your use of that word. The you know the, the the getting into booze, I get why you'd regret that, but but riddled suggests far more than that. Or am I reading too much into it? No, I have uh, so many regrets, so many regrets. I've always wondered how people can say that I don't regret anything. I do. I regret a lot of things. You know, having said that, and this seems odd in the same breath. I wouldn't change them. I wouldn't change, you know, the failure and the mistakes that I made and the people I've hurt, the things I've said, the actions that I've done out of spite. Um, I wouldn't change them because, like I said, I like who I am and I didn't always like who I was. I had moments of kind of seeing somebody that I liked. But um, yeah, re regret is, maybe it's just a word we throw around too much. It's just become so, we've come kind of desensitized to what a regret is. And it's something that you wish you hadn't have done. I've got lots of those. I want to ask you the same kind of question I once asked Tony Bennett, which was, do you ever get sick of singing San Francisco? You know. Uh, it's his signature song. Every time he does a concert, everybody expects him to sing I Left My Heart in San Francisco. And if he doesn't sing it, yeah. well, he wouldn't think of not singing it because he knows everybody wants it. And I want to ask you the same kind of question. You really can't do a concert or a show and not sing Insensitive, right? I, w I would never think of it. Mm -hmm. I would never not sing Insensitive. Um, you know, the house I'm sitting in is because of Insensitive. It's It, it all stems from that. I mean, it's one of the few out outside songs that I've ever cut like on an original album and um, it is a brilliant song Anne Lurie who wrote that song fellow Calgarian girl is a brilliant writer I, I, I wish that I had you know had seen her do other had other cuts with her fantastic writing but um, no I would never not sing that it would be like not singing good mother or not singing I would die for you or not singing could I be your girl or unloved? Like those are songs that are in my set and they always will be. Well, that, that's what Tony Bennett said, or I guess I asked him, don't you ever get sick? Is there never one moment where you're in the middle of that song and you th think, geez, I've just sung this one time too many? And he said, no, it's a fabulous <laughs> no, song I, and I never get tired of singing it. Are you the same way with Insensitive? Either. Yeah, I just, I don't get sick of them. No, hmm. I think um, it's such a blessing that, you know, that I even have a catalog of songs I mean, these days, young artists are coming up and they have a single and it's very hard to make a career on one song. Like you kind of have to have a few. Um, but I know I just I enjoy it. And we every time I sing it, it's slightly different. It's never the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a set. Well, how do you cool your lips after a summer's kiss? I've always wanted to know the answer to that. <laughs> okay, we'll save that for the next interview. Um, uh, sadly, I'm down to my last minute here, and um, I want to ask you one more very weird, quirky question, and that is, I, I think I remember hearing that once upon a time, rather than pay you $30,000 for a gig that you did, some chocolate company gave you $30,000 worth of chocolate. And I want to know if there's any of that chocolate left. I just got rid of the last gift certificate probably about five years ago. So. <laughs> 
everyone had, my mom would say to me, I wouldn't mind another one of those chocolate gift cards. And I gave them to charity. It is friggin' hard <laughs> to buy $30,000 worth of chocolate. You, you know, some people would go, no, it's so easy. It's not. It is, I would take kids, this is my Willy Wonka moment. I would take kids, my friends' kids, um, nephews, I'd be like, we'd go into the chocolate store and I'd like, pick whatever you want, take whatever you want. They're like, what? I'm like, seriously, grab whatever you want. And you'd think that these kids would go hell bent for leather, don't even know what that saying means, but take everything off the shelves and put it in a bag. They'd take like one, two things. Is this okay? I'm like, what is wrong with kids these days? Take some GD chocolate, like take that, get, they just did not have it in them. And I, I, God, if that had been me at 12 years old, I would have been Pippi long stocking it big time. Like, <laughs> well, I like the way you said GD there, just like your mother would have recommended. So that's nice. <laughs> Uh, I want to just remind everybody, if I knew then, Wisdom in Failure and Power in Aging, that is Jan Arden's latest. Her TV show is coming back as well on CTV. Uh, she's got a sitcom about her life. And oh my goodness, I don't know if you know this, 5.6 million hits on YouTube for Insensitive. 5.6 million. No kidding, it paid for the house. Jan, I hope we'll do this again in 15 years or maybe even sooner. What the heck? Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, I can't wait to see us 10 years from now. Amen to that. Take care. Coming up on the agenda in the summer. I think personally, I wanted to just like fit in and be cool. And like, I was interested in different things. You know, I was exposed to a new culture and a new country and new languages and new people. And I was very curious, you know, and so part of me felt hopeless about being connected to Sri Lanka. Like I tried to write letters to people back home, but slowly, slowly you heard news that, you know, they're not there anymore, or they've been killed, or blah, 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 has moved away. And so the life that you remembered in Sri Lanka was sort of disintegrating. And that is tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again next time. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.